Hello BC Calculus students, this is Mr. Johnson and this is the third video for section 8.2 which is on series and we are going to begin on page 23 and just work through the remaining examples starting at example 13. Um, I'm going to begin though on page 26 and this is the summary of this section which I think is really helpful. We have talked about all the different concepts and so this video is just a chance to practice the concepts and go through some of the examples. But the first three convergence tests have been outlined during this section. So our very first test is the test for divergence. It might be called the limit test, or it could be called the nth term test. And what you're doing is you're taking the limit as n goes to infinity. And if you have a value that is not 0, then the particular series is divergent. Because what that means is that you're continuing to add values as you analyze the nth term to the series and as you add more and more values it doesn't matter what size they are if they are not equal to zero those values are going to increase the sum of the series or decrease the sum of the series or possibly call it, cause it to alternate if you end up getting there's a little warning at the end here but if you end up getting zero for that very first test so if you take the limit as n goes to infinity and you get zero you do not know whether it converges or diverges and so you have to continue with your tests now remember we're going to have 10 tests in total, and so this is just the first three. Um, the second one is the geometric series test. That one is one that you um, will often be able to recognize, especially with more practice. It's going to be in the form of a r to the n minus 1. The other uh, key to this one is that if you're working on the multiple choice um, question and it says what is the value of the series or what is the sum of the series, that often is a geometric series because it's one of the very few that we can actually find the sum of. Most of the series that we analyze, you can only determine if it's convergent or divergent, and if it converges, you can you basically state that it converges, but you can't necessarily find the sum. The geometric series is a unique one where you actually can find the sum. So most often when it says what is the sum or what is the value, that's sort of a um, hint that it's a geometric series. Keep in mind your restrictions. So R must be, the absolute value of R must be less than 1 for it to converge. In other words, it has to be between negative 1 and 1. Um, and the sum formula is A divided by 1 minus R. Uh, R is our common ratio. If R is less than or equal to negative 1 or greater than or equal to positive 1, then the particular geometric series is divergent. And make sure you do not just jump to the sum formula because the sum formula will will give you a value no matter what even if it diverges you want to first consider does it converge if yes then do the sum if not it's divergent and you're done and the third one is the collapsing sum and this is the other one where we're actually able to find the true um, sum of a convergent series if it's collapsing this is not nearly as common as the geometric series but the collapsing sum or it's also called the telescoping sum is going to be in a type of form where we can decompose our fractions. So we can factor the denominator, we can split apart our fractions, and then what our, our main strategy with this one is, is to list out terms and cancel or collapse all of the terms that are going to be eliminated sort of in the middle of that series. And we look at what's left over, um, whether there's a term or two at the beginning, and then there's going to be some nth term uh, or possible set of nth terms at the end, and then we take the limit as n goes to infinity to analyze the behavior. The uh, two that we've asked you to memorize, one is the harmonic series, and that one is going to be as n goes from 1 to infinity of 1 over n, and that's going to be divergent, so we just have to memorize that. And then we have the alternating harmonic, which is almost the same thing, but it just has that alternator in there, and that's going to be convergent. And those are two that we just want to be able to identify quickly, and then we start to compare them to other ones along the way. All right, let's go ahead and start with example 13, now that we've done a quick summary. And again, I'm just going to go through some examples that cover the three tests that we've um, talked about already in this section. So there's nothing really uh, new necessarily. This is just some practice. This first one, it says, what is the sum? So I think our first thought should be, is this a geometric series? And if we can sort of, you know, get to the point where we can rewrite this as a value r to the power of n with maybe a multiplier on it, that's what we're really looking for. So in this case, um, we have 
negative 2 to the n in the numerator, and in the denominator, let's make it e times e to the n so that we're able to rewrite this in a better form for us to find the sum. So we have, let's just make it 1 over e like that, and then we have negative 2 over e to the power of n, and so now we're in the geometric form that we're used to based on our test. Remember, the 1 over e is just a, a multiplier to this. What we're focused on in particular is the negative 2 over e, which is our r value. And that particular r value, if we took the absolute value, is less than 1. So we know this converges. The a value is the first term. So if we were to substitute in n as 1, we get negative 2 divided by e squared. And since we know it converges and we have all the elements that we need, we can find the sum. So the sum is a, which is negative 2 over e squared divided by 1 minus r, so 1 plus 2 over e. And then remember, we can use a little bit of algebra here to just simplify this complex fraction quickly. So if we multiply by e squared, we get negative 2 divided by e squared plus one of the e's cancel, so you get um, 2e. And this, I'm hoping, is an answer. It's letter b. All right, so that's the geometric series. Uh, example 14, this is the review that we've done uh, with the decomposition of fractions. So this is not a series question or a sequence question. This is simply just um, making sure that we can tackle the skill of decomposition in order to analyze um, a fraction, whether it's a series or whether it's an integral like in this problem. So we have 6, and we want to, um, we want to factor the denominator, so x plus 8 and x plus 2. And this is equal to a divided by x plus 8 and b divided by x plus 2. All right, so then our first step is to multiply everything by the product of your denominators, x plus 8 times x plus 2. And we get 6 equal to a times x plus 2 plus b times x plus 8. And now we go about picking values of x. Remember, we're going to pick values of x that are easy for us to com uh, compute. So let's do x equal to negative 2. That gives us 6 equal to b times 6. So that means that b is 1. And then we can let x equal negative 8. And we get 6 equals a times negative 6. So a is negative 1. All right, so we're looking at our original fraction here, which we've now decomposed into negative 1 over x plus 8, plus 1 over x plus 2. And then remember, we're trying to take the integral of this very first fraction that we were analyzing. So now what we're going to do is just integrate the decomposition of that fraction. So we have negative ln of the absolute value of x plus 8 plus the natural log of the absolute value of x plus 2 plus c. Um, what I would do is factor out a negative here. We're just trying to tweak it to the answer. We're trying to figure out which of these answers it may look like. And that gives us negative natural log of the absolute value of x plus 8 divided by x plus 2. And as I look at the answers, c sort of stands out. However, c is not negative. Um, and so they're, they're being a little bit tricky. And, you know, again, I had mentioned in the previous video that depending on your A and B values, you're going to be okay, but it might look a little bit different than somebody else's. And this is a prime example of that. Remember the property where we can take negative one and we can um, raise the argument to that power, which in this case would reciprocate that argument. And so this is the equivalent of the natural log of the absolute value of X plus two divided by X plus eight. And that's a little bit tricky, but I'm glad you're seeing it now. This is option B. All right, let's move on to the next page. All right, we have another one of these. And again, if you want to uh, practice with me, you can. If you want to pause it, try it on your own, then check it, you can. If you feel confident with it, you can certainly skip it and move on. Um, we're just trying to give you plenty of practice on this type of concept. So we have A divided by... 2x minus 1, 
and b divided by x plus 1. This one's a little different because we haven't had a factor that has a multiplier like the 2x does. Um, and so there's, there'll be a little bit of difference with the antiderivative here. All right, we're going to multiply by the quantity 2x minus 1 times the quantity x plus 1. So we get 8x minus 10 equal to a times the quantity x plus 1 and b times the quantity 2x minus 1. So this time I'll let x equal negative 1. And on the left side, if I was to substitute in negative 1 for x, I get negative 18. And then for b, I get <clears throat> b times negative 3. So in this case, I get a b equal to positive 6. But then I'm also going to let x equal positive 1 half, which again is a little bit different. Over on the left, we get 8 times that, so that's 4 minus 10. So we get negative 6. And then a would be times, I'll make that just 1 plus 1 half. So I'll make it 3 halves instead of a decimal. And then if we multiply over, uh, we get a equal to negative 4. Okay, so again, this one's going to look a little bit different, which is good practice for us. So we have the integral of 8x minus 10 divided by our denominator. And we split apart our fractions. So what we have then is a, which is negative 4, divided by 2x minus 1, plus 6 divided by x plus 1. Now technically, if we are analyzing our antiderivative here with this first one, this 2x versus just the x plus 1 in the second example, that is actually a u substitution. Um, you're welcome to do the full u substitution, but this is one that is a technique that we started working with last year. We've done a little bit already this year. Um, you're going to multiply by 1 half because, you know, normally when you're taking the derivative of something like 2x minus 1, you would use the chain rule and multiply by 2. We're doing the antiderivative here. So we will have the negative 4. Uh, we will get 1 half the natural log of the absolute value of 2x minus 1. That, again, that comes from a u sub. I'm just saving a little bit of time and space on this, but you can do the full u sub on that particular problem. And then we have plus 6 natural log of x plus 1, and then plus c. And so what this simplifies to is negative 2 times the natural log of the absolute value of 2x minus 1 plus 6 natural log of x plus 1 plus c. And then this is option um, b. Okay, what I'm going to do, and you're welcome to fast forward and just skip this, I'm going to show you just because I want to make sure everyone understands. Um, I'm just going to do sort of a side note here as to how to find the antiderivative of this particular integral using u substitution. So if you feel confident, you can skip. Um, otherwise, you can follow along. So this would be the u value, and my du would be 2dx. <clears throat> Remember, I don't have a 2 in the original. I do have this 2x minus 1, but that's already been assigned. So this 2 I'm going to move by division. So I'm going to get 1 half du equal to dx. You can see where the 1 half comes from. So when I rewrite this in terms of u, I have um, one half of the integral of one over u du. And that's how the substitution comes about. So we have one half natural log of the absolute value of u plus c. And we would convert that back to be the natural log of the absolute value of 2x minus 1 plus c. So that's where I'm getting this, this value in, uh, I'll highlight it here in yellow. So that's where I'm getting this portion of the antiderivative is that I'm using that idea of that u sub, that that sort of anti-chain rule, if if you will. So anyway, I hope that's helpful. Okay, let's uh, let's go ahead and jump into example uh, 16. This one says that we're considering a geometric series. So we don't have to guess here. We know it's geometric. And a sub n is greater than zero for all n. The first term of the series, a sub 1, is 48. The third term is 12, so we do not know the second term. And which of the following statements about the series is true? All right, well, we're, you know, again, no, we know that it's geometric, and so remember how we analyze this. 
this first term we multiply by something to get the next term we multiply by something and get to the third term so when we uh, kind of observe what's happening to the particular series that second value must be 24 because the behavior of this particular geometric series is that we're dividing by two dividing by two and so on now with a geometric series we need to come up with a common ratio and a common ratio is what you multiply by so the common ratio which is r is equal to one half here so we're multiplying by one half to generate this and all we need to know is a couple of the terms and then the fact that it's geometric so r equal to one half means that it does um it does converge a is the first term which is 48 and so we can simply calculate the sum which is going to be 48 divided by 1 minus 1 half 1 minus r multiplied by 2 and we get 96 divided by 1 so option b is true all right let's move on to the next page uh, example 17 is a repeat. So we did this problem. You're welcome to do it again on your own. I am not going to repeat this problem. Um, and so we're just going to move on to example 18. What is the sum of the infinite geometric series? So remember, um, I mentioned this at the very beginning of geometric series, but if you are unable to look at the geometric series and know from looking at one term to the next and then to the next what the R value is, you can always take a single term and divide by the previous term. And that's one mathematical way that we can calculate the R value. And it has to be consistent, so you can always double check it. Um, you know, in this case, it would turn into this multiplication of fractions, so it'd be 25 over eight. And you could simplify this down and reduce this. You're gonna get negative two fifths, uh, sorry, negative Three fifths, because again we have you know just to help you out here. So eight will go into eight once, and eight goes into twenty-four three times. Twenty-five goes into itself once, goes in there five times. So we can simplify and then multiply. We don't obviously want to do one hundred and twenty-five times five, for example. Um, so we get an R value of negative three fifths. That does mean that it converges. The A value is the first term eight over twenty-five. And so then we have our sum, which is A divided by 1 minus R, so 1 plus 3 fifths. Remember, we're going to multiply by the largest denominator to clear fractions. So we multiply by 25, sorry. And we get 8 divided by 25 plus, and then the 5 will cancel, but we have still 5 times 3, we get 15. And that gives us 80 over 40. Uh, we could reduce that. It might help us because the answers are in decimal form. So that's going to be one-fifth, which is option A. All right, let's go ahead and move into just the remaining handful of examples here. We're trying to determine out of these examples if the series converges or, or diverges. And if it's convergent, we want to at least try to find the value if, we're, if it's possible. Now, with example 19, we need to wait on this. Um, this is um, a mistake in terms of the order. This one will be possible in section 8.4. You need a uh, one of our tests, which is called the alternating series test. And I believe we have that as uh, listed as test number seven. But anyway, we have to get there first before you can do this problem. It's um, called the alternating series test, and it's a really helpful test. Um, obviously, the name gives it away if it alternates. Um, and so we're, we're looking at... Um, that test. So we're, we're going to wait on that one. Example 20. And again, this just takes some practice because now we're kind of jumbling everything up a little bit. So my first go to almost always, not not in every problem, but almost always is take the limit, see what happens. In this case, I get one half that is not equal to zero. And by the very first, uh, actually, let's go ahead and record this. So this is the first convergence test. Uh, remember, this is sometimes called the nth term test. We have a divergent series because the limit is not equal to zero. So that test, if it works, is so easy and so fast. All right, example 21. 
Um, when I see this one, we could try the limit, but I know right away this is geometric. And the reason I know that is because my powers are N, and I know I can rearrange this to make it fit a geometric model. So again, we're looking at a ge geometric series test. Just to give ourselves a little bit of guidance here as we go through all of these. So again, we're looking for that a r to the power of n, n minus 1, something like that. So we're trying to rearrange this. We can see that the negative 3 is to the negative n. So I'm going to take 8n plus 1 and make it 8 times 8 to the n. And then I have negative 3 to the n like that. So I'm starting to rearrange this in such a way that it's going to be helpful to see the r value. That's what I'm shooting for. So I have 8, and we have negative 8 thirds to the power of n. So that's what we're shooting for in terms of a model. This gives us an r value of negative 8 thirds, and that is less than negative 1. Uh, and so for that reason, this series is divergent. We do not even want to attempt the sum, because again, that's going to confuse us. All right, example 22. So with this one, I'm going to split it up so we can analyze the parts of this algebraically. So first off, I have 1 divided by 4 to the n and 5n divided by 4 to the n. Now, I'm going to uh, just represent this a little bit more um, in terms of the this is a geometric series, but it's in two parts. But there's also some sort of misleading stuff here. So um, I'm going to write that as just 1 fourth to the n, so it looks a little bit more normal, I guess. And then I have 5 fourths to the n. In this portion, r is 1 fourth. I'm okay with that. That's convergent. However, over here, r is 5 fourths. So if we were to split this, because we have some properties that allow us to do some of this, just to think about what happens, that's going to converge to some value, right? Uh, we can figure it out, but we're not going to. Uh, then we have this one, which is going to diverge. So the question is, if you have a convergent series and you add it to a divergent series, is it magically going to converge? And the answer is no. It will not magically converge. Um, if you have some convergent set of terms and you tack on all these divergent terms, the divergent terms are going to win. So this particular one is divergent simply because there's a portion of it that is represented as a geometric series that diverges. All right, last page, just two more. Sorry, I think I cut myself off in that last part. So this is the last page here. We're going to do two more examples. Um, the very first one screams geometric series, I hope. I hope we're getting used to that now. So we have the ge uh, geometric series test for the first one. I'll break this off over on the side here as 1 tenth to the n, and then we'll do the other one over here. I'm just splitting them up. Remember, that's one of our properties. 2 over n to the, I'm sorry, 2 over 10 to the n. All right, the blue one, we have r equal to 1 tenth. That's good news. That's convergent. And a is 1 tenth. So let's go ahead and find the sum. It is 1 tenth divided by 1 minus 1 tenth, multiplied by 10, multiply by 10, and we get uh, 10 divided by 10 minus 1, sorry, not 10, excuse me, we get 1 divided by 10 minus 1, so 9. So the sum of that first one is going to be 1 ninth, so we'll keep that in mind. Then for the green one, we have r equal to 2 tenths. That's good news, that's convergent, and a is equal to 2 tenths. So we have the sum equal to 2 tenths divided by 1 minus 2 tenths. Again, multiply by 10, multiply by 10 clear fractions. We have a 2 divided by 10 minus 2, so that's going to be 8. And that gives us 1 fourth. All right, now we simply add these up. Because we've found these two different geometric series, we're going to combine them. So we have 1 ninth plus 1 fourth. We can go back to our good old days of math where we have a common denominator and we add them up. So multiply this one by 4, multiply that one by 9. We have a common denominator of 36, so we get 13 over 36, which is our value. So it's convergent. I'll rewrite this. So this one is convergent 
to 13 over 36. So in other words, the sum of that particular series is 13 over 36. All right, last one, example number 24. So I'm going to take the limit of this one as n goes to infinity. Sometimes when it's in factored form, it's a little confusing to us. But remember, ultimately, that denominator, if we were to distribute all out, and I'm not going to take the time to do it, we would get 3n to the third, and then we would get other stuff. Okay, it would be n squared, it would be n to the first, you know, some sort of constant. I mean, there would be some positives and negatives. I don't really care because in the denominator, the largest power is going to be n cubed. And I know when I distribute all this out, I'm going to get 3n cubed and then plus or minus some stuff. Okay, all that stuff is obsolete as n goes to infinity. And so we're looking at the ratio of these leading coefficients, which is one third. That limit is not zero. And so this is simply divergent and we can be done. All right, you can see the summary. I know I, I mentioned that already at the beginning of the video. So hopefully you have that written down. Um, it's a really nice, um, I don't know, clip, set of clip notes kind of for the section. Uh, we will continue to do that as we dive into the next section where we tackle a few more tests. And then in section 8.4, where we finish off the tests. Again, you're gonna have 10 of them. And we're going to give you a nice synopsis of all those tests, but you do have to start to dig into these and memorize these and know how to use them. Uh, that will be greatly beneficial. Okay, now your task is to practice more problems in 8.2. Thank you.